Now to a crisis deep within the heart of the United States, racism. Our next guest, the author and retired Naval Commander Theodore Johnson, argues that racism is an ex existential threat to America. But he says that all is not lost. In his new book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Johnson lays out a blueprint for healing the nation. And here he is guiding Michelle Martin through that process. Thanks, Bianca. Theodore Johnson, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Your book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, is, is beautifully written. It has some sort of beautiful meditations about citizenship, about race and citizenship. But it also has some, I would argue, some fairly provocative theses. And I'd like to go through some of those with you. You make the argument that, that the, the, despite the fact that the country has survived, you know, these centuries with racism a very much a part of American life, you argue that racism continues to be an existential threat to this country. Why do you say that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so just historically, if we look back, the, the one time our nation literally broke into two pieces was over the question of race and, and really the status of Black Americans in this country. That's the only thing that's ever literally broken us and caused one million casualties in the process. But the idea in the book is, is a, a little bit more philosophical than that. Rather, what I'm arguing in the book is that racism, racial inequality, uh, does not and cannot coexist with um, the idea that we are all created equal with these unalienable rights, uh, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and a government where its powers derive from the consent of the governed. So I am saying that structural racism is an existential threat to the idea of America. And I separate the idea of America, the promise of America, from the nation state, the United States. So as you said, the United States have lived, has lived quite comfortably at times with racism, with chattel slavery, with Jim Crow, uh, but the idea of America has never been comfortable with structural racism, with racial inequality. Whenever uh, racial prog progress happens, the idea of America is achieved, is realized in, in full, or at least in more context. Uh, but whenever racial revanchism happens, whenever we allow racism to uh, perpetuate itself in, in our structures, then the idea of America recedes. And so either we confront the problems, the challenges that racism presents to this country, or we admit that our commitment to the professed ideals of America are, are basically superficial rhetoric, and we're more married to commandeering as much of America for ourselves and those like us, instead of trying to create a truly multiracial egalitarian society. And you say that this happens even as, that this is happening even as the country has moved in many ways toward its ideals, that the country has moved closer to its ideas, but yet it remains deeply polarized. You say that the nation we have and the nation we want are separated by a vast sea, and that we wonder aloud how a country that has inarguably become more aligned to its founding principles over the last couple of centuries remains confounded by racial injustice and conflict at every turn. You say we are hopeful, yes, but we are tired. Mm. Why tired? Yeah. So we are 245 years old as a nation this year. And for the entire length of our nation's history, and even in the, the, the centuries preceding it, there have been people excluded from the rights and privileges of citizenship that have been fighting incessantly for inclusion. Uh, look, the progress is real. I am much happier being a Black man in America in 2021 than in 1921 and certainly than in 1821. So progress is undeniable. But we have not yet achieved the kind of multiracial egalitarian society that is in our, in our ideals, that's captured in the Declaration and, and in the Constitution. So the fight continues to create this world where racial hierarchy doesn't exist, where structural racism doesn't uh, influence the past that people take in our country that doesn't make the the climb to the american dream steeper for some groups than others so the the, the fight continues which means we many of us are quite tired of it but look we draw inspiration from those who came before us um, if those who were enslaved could somehow manage to keep hope and optimism and faith alive in hopes that maybe their children or children's children would be emancipated and be fully embraced as americans then certainly today um, we can hold on to that same faith and optimism in hopes that we can leave behind a better country than the one that we inherited. 
One of the points that you make, though, is that the American experiment is a novel undertaking. Um, you quote the Harvard political theorist, theorist Daniel Allen, who's written that the simple fact of the matter is that the world has never built a multi-ethnic democracy in which no particular ethnic group is in the majority and where political equality, social equality, and economies that empower all have been achieved. So having said that, why do you think it can be? When enslaved Black people were here in the country, if someone told them uh, one day there will be a civil war and the result of this will be the abolishment of slavery, many of them would say, I don't believe the country has it in them. If some folks, had, as, as Black folks are being lynched throughout the South, some of them in their military uniforms returning from service after World Wars I and II, if someone said one day there will be a Black president in this country, they would say, I don't think we can do it. And so the, the, the path that I, I hope to illuminate in this book is that there is a way forward. Now, whether we are big enough people, whether we are courageous enough, whether we are committed enough to the cause to create the nation of our I, our ideals is a different question and one that we will we must answer. What, what's the way forward? Let's talk about that. I mean, one of the, as I said, that your your um, your book addresses themes that many people have undertaken before. I mean, Du Bois, du, Douglas, so many people have undertaken this question of what does citizenship mean in a in a in a country in which equal rights are not are promised but not delivered. But right. one of the arguments you make is that it requires an understanding that racism is a crime of the state. Right. What does that mean? Well, the, the basic argument here is that if we try to make the United States live up to the ideals of America, this promise of America, by only making moral claims, by claiming our, our inherent right to equality, by demanding full access to all of the constitutional rights based on, on, on a moral basis, um, nation states are not moved by moral claims, except when those moral claims are aligned to the national interest. And so the point here is that nation states are governed by their interests not by some absolute sense of goodness or morality. And so when we allow racism to perpetuate itself in our structures, the way our society is built, the public policy that's passed and, and then and implemented, um, then it is the fault of the nation state that we still see racial inequality resulting from the way our society is structured. It is not white people being mean to black people that causes the wealth gap. It's, it's not white people being mean to Hispanic people that causes uh, inequality in healthcare outcomes. It is that we have a society structured in such a way that inequality is the product of those structures. And that is the fault of the state for not being uh, active enough, progressive enough in its public policy to address such structures so that they create outcomes that live up to our ideals about uh, this inherent inequality. How do you understand the former president, Donald Trump, in the context of all the things you've been talking about? When you are able to weaponize racial diversity and, and stoke fears of other groups in order to, um, because of political expedience, or in order to hold on or, or, or get electoral power or political power, then not only are you dividing the country, you are actually behaving in an un-American way if you believe in the principles inscribed in our founding documents. And what Donald Trump was able to do was get people to stop focusing on the America of principle, equality, liberty, freedom, and get people to focus on the idea that their group was losing their place in America and trigger those anxieties and fears in order to have certain folks okay with the oppression of other folks. Because um, the idea was that was the only way the America of their grandparents' generation could be uh, secured. This is not true. It's a false equivalency, but, um, but it is effective politics for those who aren't interested in, in uh, making America a better version of itself. I mean, among the founding uh, leaders of the country, this debate was had about whether this country could be a truly democratic and egalitarian society and maintain slavery. And the decision was, yeah, it can. Yeah. So yeah. what did you think that people in the current era will disagree? Well, so, so the, the, the hill is, is steep. It, it's, this is not an easy task, but I think two things have to happen. Um, when the founding fathers created this nation, and decided that the union, establishing the union was more important than getting rid of slavery, they made a, a national interest decision, which goes back to the earlier part in our conversation. 90 years later, 
they decided the only way to keep the union was to abolish slavery. The horror of slavery didn't change in that, those 90 years, but the interests of the nation did, such that the, keeping the union was the most important thing. Keeping slavery helped it, its creation. Getting rid of slavery helped it in the, its reunification. So, and we could, I could go through historical examples through the civil rights movement forward about how marrying the national interest to the racially correct thing to do, the racial, racially equitable thing to do, um, it leads to great progress. The way forward, two, two things have to happen. First is we have to show the ways that racial inequality um, harm the national interest. We don't need wars. Certainly we don't need another global pandemic because both have proven not to be the unifying thing that a lot of folks think they are. But we do need uh, a set of leaders, local up through national, to be able to make the connection between racial inequality and the national interest. The second thing is we don't know each other. If you look at people's social circles, they are homogenous. Uh, I think one of the stats I quote in the book is like something like 80 to 90% of the people in the country have zero or one person who don't share their race or ethnicity in their intimate social circle. So we don't talk to one another. So when someone shows up on the scene and says, that group over there, they're the reason your taxes are so high. That group over there, they're the reason you're, you don't have a job or unemployment is so high in your community. They're the reason why um, our, there's terrorism happening in the, in the world, et cetera. And you don't know people from that group, it is hard to be resilient to those devices of appeals because you're looking for someone or something to blame for why the American promise hasn't been extended to you, why the American dream is so hard for you to reach. And so the one thing we can do today, all of us, and this is something black folks have been doing since the beginning, is get out of our social circles that are homogenous and interact with people that are unlike us. We have to be able to interact socially if we're ever going to um, have the opportunity to establish some kind of multiracial solidarity. You talk a lot in the book, and I think that most people who follow the news see the same things that you do, you know, a very uh, polarized country. But the, you know, division in this country isn't just about race. I mean, we're seeing confrontations over mask mandates. I mean, we're seeing confrontations over getting a vaccine. So how do you, how do you explain that? Look, a lot of political scientists have spent time showing all of the fractures in our democracy that have occurred over the last uh, decade plus. Um, some would say hyperpartisanship is the thing that's tearing us apart. Um, others have said, you know, what the real issue is is economic inequality. The haves now have so much, while as the have-nots have gained nothing for several decades, and if we don't address this economic inequality, then the nation will break apart. We could look at the antitrust era from over a century ago to show the dangers of the mega rich having too much power in a country. And yet a, a third group would say at the, the issue is really sort of this undemocratic populism where popular figures and demagogues get to commandeer our systems of democracy and justice to do things that are undemocratic and unjust and unjust. And, uh, and th that, could also be a, a fracture. The, the argument the book makes is if you dissect all of those three things, you will find racial inequality at the heart. If we solve economic inequality tomorrow, racism will still create a nation where equity, equality does not exist. If we get rid of the populist demagogues, racism will still exist. If we address hyperpartisanship and have more bipartisan compromise, et cetera, racism will still exist. And we don't have to guess. We have seen these things um, rise and, and, and sort of recede in our nation's history. And the thing that has remained is racial inequality resulting from bad public policy and good public policy. So in this way, racial inequality, structural, structural racism is the thing that if we can figure that out, then we actually have a chance of addressing hyperpartisanship. We have a chance of addressing some of these illiberal tendencies. But if we leave racism unattended, it will be the thing that that harms the country in ways that no other set of policy prescriptions will solve. If you were to present your book to your former colleagues in the military, how do you think that they would receive it? Because on the one hand, you know, we talk about the military as being the most successfully integrated institution in America. Um, on the other hand, we see that, you know, these issues have existed in the military and in some ways do persist. What's your take on, on whether your colleagues in the military, your former colleagues in the military see this the way you do? Mm. Um, so a, a few things here. One, 
is when General Milley was questioned uh, just a few weeks ago about critical race theory, et cetera, he says, what's so- Who's the chairman all, of the Joint Chiefs? Uh, who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, right? Who's he white? Said, who's white for who those is who white? That's right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He, he said, what's so wrong with wanting to understand the nation we're defending? And this book is that. It is a patriotic look at the challenge that structural racism presents to the existence of the American idea. Um, if you can't get on board with that in the military, um, wanting to understand your country that you're defending and recognizing that there is much to value in this nation, I, I don't know that, that you can be reached by the vast majority of folks. There, there's an, a, a quote from a, a, a British philosopher or military strategist that basically says, the nation that will insist on um, dividing its thinking men and its fighting men will find its thinking done by cowards and its, and its fighting done by fools. All of the things that we've fought for in the Constitution, we've made tremendous progress on extending rights and privileges to more people, but we have not created the more perfect union yet, that we have not um, closed the gap between who we say we are and who we profess to be. You say, though, in the book that, you know, sort of on the, the hopeful side of the ledger, that we all want the same things. And you cite a number of data points to support that idea. But do we really? I mean, do we really all want the same things? If mm. some people are just invested in racial hierarchy because it advantages them. Yeah, th this is this is a real question. And um, I would say that the vast majority of Americans, and this is you know based on polling, et cetera. So um, I, I think it's, there's, there's something there that if you ask, do you believe in democracy? Do you believe in equality and freedom and liberty, prosperity, um, egalitarianism, et cetera? Most Americans would say yes um, to that question. So on the first principles of our nation, um, these things, again, captured in our founding documents, most Americans agree, yes, I want this multiracial egalitarian uh, democracy. And then when you take that next step and say, here's what it's going to cost to get this thing you say you want, that's when you get a lot of people bailing out because they're realizing, oh, I have to sacrifice something, my status in society, my tax dollars, something material in order to realize this multiracial egalitarian democracy of our dreams. I don't know how long, how committed I am to it anymore, but they don't say that out loud. So the question before the country, is do we really want democracy? The question before the country is, do we really believe in the idea, the promise of America? If we don't, then we need to say so explicitly and say that, no, actually we do believe in racial hierarchy. We do believe that using violence to keep the racial order in place is a good thing. And then we will have a United States, but it will be one that is uh, a terrible uh, version of who we are today, and one that is reminiscent of the people we used to be, that we decided we no longer wanted to be uh, centuries ago. There's no shortcut to utopia. The more perfect union is going to require more perfect people, and we have to decide whether we're up to the task or not. Ted Johnson, your latest book is called When the Stars Begin to Fall. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you so much for having me.